G'day, I'm Mike Hayes and welcome to Jazz Guitar Chord Melody, Part 56. Well, as usual, we have another action-packed program for you, but today's a really special one because we look at ways of dealing with the biggest challenge that every guitarist who plays chord melody style must deal with. So if you're thinking, what the heck is this guy talking about? The biggest challenge is finding a car park at the gig. Or it might be finding someone that will help you move the amp. Or you might be looking for that very special gauge string that will give you that jazz tone that you're looking for. Well, I'll admit that all those things are challenging, but the challenge I'm speaking about is bigger than the whole lot of those guys put together. So stay tuned to find out a, what it is, and then B, how to deal with it. We'll also be doing some review of some of the techniques that we've been speaking about in the last couple of sessions, and we'll be applying those in our new chord melody arrangement. If this is the first time on the channel, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you'll be notified just as soon as our latest video is available. So time to sharpen those picks because it's going to be another day of slaving over a hot guitar. Well, someone's got to do it. I guess it might as well be us. Okay, let's go check it out. In today's session, we're going to take a close look at the biggest challenge facing guitarists who play chord melody style. Since chord melody style guitar is almost always performed in a solo guitar setting, the problem is, how does the guitarist enchant the listener and hold their attention for the duration of their performance? If we were to listen to a piece of high-quality classical music played by a professional orchestra, our attention and interest would be maintained by the tonal colours of the various instruments in the orchestra. Oddly enough, the key to developing a successful chord melody style on guitar can be found in studying how does a solo pianist deal with the exact same problem. So before we dive in and get to work on all our guitar stuff for today, let's take a few moments out to look at orchestral music versus solo piano. And how does the solo pianist take the idea and how do they manipulate that idea without the amount of tonal colour that is available to the orchestra setting? I'm using the example of orchestral music. However, the same could be said of a large jazz ensemble, such as the Duke Ellington Orchestra. Now, you probably haven't thought much about solo piano playing. However, in general, professional pianists are much better at carrying the can on their own than solo guitarists. Of course, there are some notable exceptions, but in general, the piano guys handle the solo instrument gig much better. If you are interested in listening to some solo piano, but don't know where to start, I personally would recommend having a listen to the Chilean pianist Claudio Oro. I'll put a link in the description below. In particular, have a listen to his rendition of Debussy's Claire de Lune. Pay particular attention to the level of expression he brings to the music. When I'm working on a solo guitar arrangement, the two things I'm focused on are one, tonal colour, and two, the expression. Tonal colour is the putting together of the various parts. Things such as chord textures, which string sets will I play them on, chord qualities. That's the assembling of the musical elements on the guitar fingerboard. And with regard to expression, that's where the use of rubato, dynamics, being aware of the lyrics. And the lyrics are very important as a source of inspiration and phrasing. Now we're going to apply all these things to our guitar arrangement, which we're going to start on in just a moment. But to sum up, tonal colour is essentially about where will I play it on the guitar, 
and the expression element deals with how will I play it. The tune we'll be working on today has been around a long time. It's called Bye Bye Blackbird. The music written by Ray Henderson and lyrics by Mort Dixon. It was first published in 1926. The song is a 32 bar song form and generally speaking in the fake books they usually label the form as A and B. But for the purpose of what we're going to do, I'm going to label it A, B, C, A1, with each section being 8 bars in length. you see why I'm thinking like this when we start putting the arrangement together. OK, just in case you don't know the tune, here is the melody of Bye Bye Blackbird. Remember, I'm playing the melody an octave higher than written, and I'm also playing the melody freely. In other words, I'm playing it as if I was singing it. And I can assure you, my guitar does sing a lot better than me. Here goes. Because this tune has been around for a long time, there's many different variations on the basic set of chords. I'm going to use a fairly standard set of chords. Here is the melody and the basic changes for Bye Bye Blackbird. <laughs> Before we get into the arranging side of things, I'm going to put on a rhythm track for you to practice the melody along with the basic changes. Here goes. Thank you. 
focus for this session will be on the first eight bars, and in particular, the first two bars. I'm going to play several different examples of how I might approach playing the first two bars. In this first example, I'm going to play an F major 7th under the A notes in the first bar, and then a G minor 7th on the B flat note, returning back to the F major 7th for the two A notes in bar 2. Let's have a listen to example number 1. For this next example, this is where the expression comes in that I spoke about earlier. I'm using the lyrics as a source of inspiration here. The word care in bar 2. I'm going to play a more serious chord than G minor 7. I'm going to play G minor 7 flat 5. In this example, I'm going to leave everything else exactly the same as the previous example. Only this time I'm playing a G minor 7 flat 5 under the B flat note. Let's have a listen. Can you hear the difference that one chord made? And that might be just the thing you're after to help convey the type of expression you want to to the listener without actually singing the lyrics. Here's the same two bars, only this time I'm going to start with a triad. I'm going to play an F triad under the first two notes in bar one, and then I'm going to play an F augmented triad under the next two notes in bar one. When I get to the B flat note, I'm going to play a G minor seventh chord, and then under the A notes, I'm going to play F major seventh. So this really is a study in chord textures. I'm starting with triads and then moving on to four note chords. Let's have a listen. Here's another way we could approach the first two bars. We just heard in the previous example where we had this line moving up with the augmented chord. The note on string 3 moved from a C note in the F triad up to a C sharp in the F augmented and then it moved to a D note in the G minor chord. So we had this upward movement. In this example, I'm going to create a downward movement with the lower notes in each chord. Here goes. We're going to have one more example, but just before we do, I want to explain my thinking behind this approach. I'm going to play the first eight bars. And my intention with this first section is to have a very vague, whimsical sort of sound. I'm going to use our friends the tone clusters, and it's going to be a very atonal type of feel. And then when we hit the B section, my intention is to turn it into more of a diatonic type of sound. So just for today's session, I'm going to play the first eight bars, and this is a classic case of the music taking us to the technique. I'm going to put this example on twice. The first time, the diagrams will show the fingering that I'm using, and this is very important because I want to keep the phrasing very smooth, and again, that's due to the lyrics of the song. I don't want to have the chords chopping and changing. Also, I'm making use of rubato. I'm playing it in a very free time feel. And also, I'm thinking about dynamics. So the first time through, we're going to have the fingerings marked on 
the diagrams and then I'll play the same eight bars with the notes indicated on the diagrams. Here we go. Here's the same eight bars with the notes indicated. Okay, that's it for this session, folks. But just before we go, I'm going to put on the first 16 bars of that arrangement. So we're going to hear the A section and the B section. And the B section is part of what we'll be working on in the next session. There we go, folks. No matter where you are in the world, I sincerely hope you've got something out of today's session. Don't forget, if you have any questions or comments, to pop them in the comments section below in the video. And as always, I look forward to catching up with you again next time. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.